Uh, what am I saying? <laughs> this is MPW, 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 the podcast with your host, Zylo Aria. Cool. A podcast about music, music production for the everyday musician, where we learn from experienced studio engineers and, and each other. Jessica Thompson is a Grammy-nominated mastering and restoration engineer. She has digitized, restored, and revived historic recordings from the likes of jazz pianist Errol Garner to folk pop star Norma Tanega. Jessica is a former president and current governor of the San Francisco chapter of the Recording Academy and also serves on the Audio Engineering Society Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Hi, Jessica. Lovely to have you on this episode for a second time, which I very much appreciate because my laptop crashed and we lost the episode. But thank you for joining me again. And how's your day been so far? So far, so good. It's my pleasure to record this again. I think the first one was a dress rehearsal. So hopefully this one... (laughs) All my answers are extra snazzy and we'll have a great conversation. That sounds good. Your answers were perfect the first time, but yes, that's a great way to look at it. So before we jump into audio restoration and getting into all of your expertise on that, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you and where things started for you in music and how you got to where you are today, if you can give us a bit of a summary. You know, so many of my colleagues grew up in the music industry with parents who were performers or engineers or A&R people. And I didn't really have that, although I did grow up in a family in which music was always present. But I was not one of those kids who excelled at playing an instrument or joined bands or even tinkered with things like cassette decks and was on this very obvious path toward being an audio engineer. Uh, It was a pretty circuitous path that brought me to where I am today. And mostly I would say college radio was my gateway drug. I was a DJ on my college radio station and through that became comfortable working the gear in the studio. Wound up working at a professional radio station straight out of college. I worked at WGBH in Boston, one of their public radio stations. And that really for me, was where I found a love of the technical side of audio production. So from there, I went to grad school, I got an internship, and then just worked really hard for 20 years. That's a great, great summary. And was it something specific that brought you to audio restoration? And is that something that you started in or or was it something that you kind of stumbled upon and you were thinking, oh, this sounds like fun? It wasn't something I started in, but... In my first internship that quickly grew into an assistant job, I did have the opportunity to work on an archiving project of just these amazing tapes. I'll just name drop. It was Lou Reed. So if you can imagine my first real studio job and I am responsible for quality control and I'm just listening to all these amazing recordings Lou Reed made throughout his career. And I was absolutely hooked on that as a profession. I felt like it was such a good match for my temperament and my ability to focus and really get into the details. But also, I loved that process of discovering the gems that you were unable to access until you could play back that tape. Mm, I love that. And I'm sure there's something magical about listening to things that potentially no one has really heard before you. So that would be pretty special. So going to a bit of time travel, is there any event in your life that you feel you would change or if not change, anything that you feel like you've learned the most from? There's so, so many things. I mean, nothing major that I would change. I feel incredibly fortunate to be where I am and I love my job and I love where I live and I have a lot of gratitude for that. I think that another pathway for me, I think I could have gone further academically and studied music professionally, or if not, you know, directly music performance, I wish I'd taken more classes in like ethnomusicology, music history, music and technology. And I feel like I have it in me to write a book someday. I guess there's still time, but I think I would have been a great PhD student if I had not directly pursued audio engineering. I see. Okay. Well, never say never, I guess. (laughs) 
There's still time. Yeah, exactly. People start PhDs at all different stages. So perhaps there's one in you. <laughs> there might be. That's great. Yeah, yeah. And is there a random fact that you'd like to share with us about you, not necessarily music related? I grew up in Wyoming, which is something not many people know about me. Not that I don't, I don't broadcast it and not that I'm not proud of it, but like, how does a kid from Wyoming, from rural Wyoming, wind up working at studios in New York City and the Bay Area and doing all the things I do? I, I don't know how I wound up on that path, but I am a rural kid at heart, literally grew up on the prairie. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I think it's a good thing for people to hear that if you are you have worked in studios in New York and things, it's not that that opportunity has to be there if you're from there and it can come about wherever you're from as long as you make those opportunities for yourself. Absolutely. So true. Yeah, that's good. So getting into your career as an audio restoration engineer, can you talk me a little bit through the start of the process? Like where does it usually start? Who actually comes to you with the files? Is it a manager? Is it a record label? Where does the process start? I would say audio restoration can happen um, at any point during the music making process. For me, I use audio restoration on new recordings that someone just made that are going out to the streaming services. And then of course I use them on all the historic stuff I work on. Since restoration is really about shifting this relationship between this wanted signal and some sort of noise that's getting in the way, my job is to examine and understand that relationship and try to figure out how to present the music in a way that the listeners can really immerse themselves and focus on the beauty of the song, the beauty of the performance, and not a click or a pop or some hiss or rumble or other noise that's going to prevent them from really enjoying the music. So that might be a, a vague way of describing it, but there are times, in, from a practical perspective, there are times when restoration is the first thing I do, and then there are times when it's the last thing I do. Sometimes it's both. Okay. So would it then be an artist that comes to you and they've recorded something and not realize that there's this kind of noise in the background or something? Or would it be in the case of old files that are being restored? Who would be bringing that work to you? It's a mix of the artist, sometimes the producer, sometimes an engineer. Sometimes I work with the family of an artist who has passed away and we are trying to figure out what they left behind and what we can do with it. So, you know, a lot of different scenarios, but yeah, I'd say most of the time it's the artist or producer that comes to me. Okay. And what are the main issues that you find that audiophiles tend to have that need to be fixed? It depends on the era and how the file was recorded and how it was digitized. You can think of some of the obvious examples that are connected to the physical media. Like we think of old 78 RPM discs as having a lot of surface noise like crackles and pops. And we think of cassette tape as having a lot of hiss or sometimes a lo-fi quality or sometimes kind of a wobbly quality to it because cassettes run at a very slow speed and that gives you some room for things to wobble as they're going over the tape head. So sometimes it's based on the media and then sometimes it can be how something was recorded, like a mic preamp was set too high and then you get distortion or the mic was off center and there's sort of a weird stereo image thing happening. Sometimes it's a digital glitch that happened down the road. I, you know, these days, sometimes I get video recordings where they want me to work on the audio because they were very focused on how things looked visually and forgot that if the audio is not solid, you're going to have all sorts of interference or clicks and pops or wind noise or mic noise and things like that. So those are a few examples. Okay. So in the scenario where it is a physical media rather than a digital one, would you start with creating a digital recording of it or is it more like fixing that record or tape first or how does that work? 
One thing that may surprise your listeners is that when it comes to digitizing what we think of as a like an analog media item, like a take, the preparation process can sometimes take twice as long as the actual playback process. So preparing to digitize something, that might mean cleaning it. It might mean repairing splices. It might mean, in the case of analog tape, getting a good pack by doing a slow wind. You might have to bake a tape if it's of an era where there are problems with sticky shed. There are so many things you have to do before you even hit play. Then once all that's done, you get to hit play and fingers crossed, sit back for 15 minutes or half an hour and just listen to a beautiful recording. If you do all the preparation right, hitting play is the easy part. Right. Okay. Yes. I had no idea about that. It sounds like such a niche part of music, Jessica. I don't know many people that would know the background of that. That's very interesting. So what would you say are the main tools that you use most often in the restoration process? For restoration, I think like most folks in our industry, I'm a heavy user of Isotope. They just released RX-10. And I, you know, like the day it came out, I was like, I will pay for the upgrade. <laughs> They're doing pretty phenomenal things. And I have to say it's, uh, I've been using it since very early versions and it's come so far in how you can use those tools to really analyze and dig into complex sounds and extract the noise. And that one, I love using spectral pair. I use it for de-clicking and de-crackling. I also like the deconstruct module if people want to get in deep with Isotope RX. But then there's a whole suite of other tools for use in audio restoration that if anyone's interested, I really like what this company Zenaptic is doing. They have a tool called Unchirp that is specifically designed to take out the artifacts from like an MP3. So talk about like a new way of thinking about audio restoration. This, this was like a problem we didn't have 20 years ago because we weren't worried about MP3s at that time. But now we need a tool to help us get rid of those like weird chirpy artifacts from MP3s. And Zynaptic did it. Okay, I see. I wonder if there's any of these that the average listener would listen out for because I'm trying to think if there are any MP3 files that I've listened to that just sound a bit weird. Sometimes you hear it on podcasts and audiobooks if they've been exported and delivered as a as kind of a low quality MP3. They'll sound very like S's will be really prominent or they sound kind of like they're going through a metal tube. Like I notice that all the time because it's my job, of course. But that's where Zynaptic's unchirp tool would come in handy. I see. I see. Actually, now that you mention it, I can think of times when I've had a low quality mp3 file and i'm like oh it just doesn't sound good yeah so okay synaptic we'll have to keep that in mind and when we talk about noise in recording is there a certain level that's acceptable uh is there something that you're trying to achieve with that the way i think about it a long time ago one of my mentors gave me this image of thinking about a little red flag that pops up when you hear something that distracts you from the music. So that stuck with me. And now when I'm working, I am listening to the music. I'm trying to be present with what the artist is trying to convey. And then if a little red flag pops up, I'm like, oh, I got to fix that. So those little red flags could be a little bit of distortion or a pop or some sibilance or any of those little noises that can happen in any recording that in my brain sets off a little red light and then I have to fix it. Okay. Yeah. That's a great way to look at it on trying to work out what was the original intention with that recording and putting your mind in that space. And then when we talk about the process of restoration, is there a particular order in doing things that's best? Like, for example, if you have a digital recording and you mentioned there might be sibilance, there might be noise, pops or clicks, is there certain things that you will address first or is it just as you hear them, you'll kind of look at that issue? Some preferred orders of operations. I think the way to think of it is what's really getting in the way. When you listen to something and it's not right, sometimes you have to address the elephant in the room first 
and that might be just a huge noise floor problem. So I would deal with getting the signal and noise balance a little better before I would go into the detail work. Sometimes it's a frequency problem. If something is just super muddy or super hissy, you got to find a little balance before you can really dig in and even comprehend what the recording is meant to be. Okay. Actually, I wonder, Jessica, if you can help me with an issue that I recently had with a podcast that I of was course. recording and our guest had a lot of issues on their side in recording and there was noise everywhere, but it was not the same all the way through. So some parts would be really noisy, some parts wouldn't be noisy. And I feel like with some of the tools I've used, they've worked really well where the noise is sort of consistent, but when it chopped and changed a lot, I've really struggled with that. So what would you do in that process? Would you cut it up in pieces and address them differently? Or is there another way to do it? Uh, I wish there were a shortcut, but um, <laughs> it sounds like the kind of restoration that can be a total marathon. And really the only way to approach it is to go through like section by section, you know, sometimes second by second. Sometimes I try to group the like noises together. So if there's a particular noise that's popping up, I'll do one pass and address that, and then I'll go back and address something else. Or if it's like a broadband noise that is louder at some points and quieter at some points, you can go through again, like section by section and dial it in as needed. But sorry to say there's, usually there's no shortcut. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, it's that's like, what I was get looking comfy. for. But... <laughs> yeah, get, get comfy and, and dig in. It's going to take a while. Okay. Yeah. No, it's good. I will keep that in mind for next time. And is there any tips that you would give to someone who's looking to start a career in audio restoration? Yes. So one thing I always recommend is you got to practice, right? This is, it's a craft and you have to practice using the tools and you have to use them wrong to know why you're doing it, why that's wrong. And you have to try things like many, many multiple times to figure out what's going to work best. So I always recommend people find some material to practice on. It's not that hard these days to find some um, messed up recordings that you can restore. But if folks are looking for material, I usually send them to the Internet Archive, archive.org. They have collections of 78s that you can download high res, totally free, open source and you can practice restoring them on your own. They also have LP recordings and they have you know, like literally millions and millions of recordings that are available to be downloaded. So that's a good place to go for practice material. Then restore something, take a break, restore it again, compare the first and the second version, take a couple days off, restore it again, compare all three. That's the way to really get to know your tools and to get to know these different approaches. There's no one right way to do it. You can restore something very aggressively and really remove a lot of the noise. Maybe that strips away too much of the ambience of the recording. So you want a lighter touch. How do you know what those parameters are? You just have to try and try and try and then do it for 20 more years. <laughs> okay, okay. No, that's a great, great tips and advice there. So you mentioned archive.org, was it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. So people can keep that in mind if they want to um, want to give it a go and improve their skills. So what would you say has been your most memorable project that you've worked on? Oh, there have been a lot. I feel like every year a new one kind of takes first place in my most memorable projects, <laughs> personal <laughs> ranking. <laughs> I have worked with the Errol Garner project for like I feel like it's like a decade now. And that's been just an enormous part of my life as a restoration engineer, everything from digitizing tapes that literally were found in like a closet to working on uh, classic, iconic recordings on restoring them and remastering them for the public. So that's a really, really big one. And then there are projects that just hit me in my heart that I feel so close to either because I feel really proud of the work that I was able to contribute to the project or the music just really speaks to me. And I will say I did, I did this collection for anthology recordings of Norma Tanega, 
She was kind of a, a folk singer, but had a, a kind of a strange career. She's probably most well known now because the theme song to the TV show, What We Do in the Shadows, You're Dead, is Norma Tanega. <laughs> so that's, I think, that's most people's gateway to her work. But her recordings and these demos that we worked on were so intimate and her songwriting is so brilliant and her guitar playing is just phenomenal and this was someone i'd never heard of until this project landed in my studio and i fell in love with her and i worked so hard on that project to make it sound good because i wanted everyone else to fall in love with her too oh that sounds incredible to really build such a strong relationship with the music that you get to work on okay i'll have to check out her music as well norma tanega So now we are coming to our speed quiz. Jessica, are you ready? I am ready, yes. Okay, we've got five quick fire questions. First thing that pops into your head. All right, Mac or PC? Mac. Spotify or Apple Music? I actually don't use either of those. I okay. subscribe to <laughs> Cobas. So um, yeah, hat tip to Cobas. You can purchase high res audio from Cobas, which I do frequently when I want a good reference track for my work. Ah, okay. So you can stream good thing to think about. Yeah, stream or purchase. Mm, Cobas. Okay, cool. We will keep that in mind. All right, live DJ or live band? Live band. Digital or analog? Oh, I mean, look at my studio. I'm such a mix of both. <laughs> I really, I, yeah, that's like a Sophie's choice for me. I love them both. Okay. All right. All right. We'll let you have that one. Quality or vibe? Ooh, another really tough one. And I have to say my gut said vibe. And that's because I think that vibe is really what connects us to art, not necessarily quality. That's a, okay. there's some philosophy there. So that I'm going to end it at that. <laughs> Okay. Okay. That's good. Um, yeah, we'll go with vibes. So that was not the speediest of quizzes, but we learned a bit through that. So that was good. <laughs> awesome. So coming to our top tips, Jessica, what would you say is your one top career tip? Approach this career with humility and with the understanding that like any craft, it takes a long time to get good at it. And you have to know that you're going to be dedicated to putting in the hours. I mean, I'm still learning. Every time I step in the studio, I have to learn something new and I have to figure something out. And that that is what this career is. So to be humble about your skills as an engineer and to know that at the end of the day, our job is really to provide a service to our clients and to help them usher their music into the world. Okay, that's great. And it's a good reminder that things don't happen overnight and you need to keep working on your craft because I think in any part of the music industry, it can be really discouraging to feel like you're not getting anywhere, but to really plug away at it and keep going. Yeah. That's good. And what is your one top self-care tip? Go outside. I know what it's like to work in studios with no windows. I have a window now, but I have worked in plenty of studios with no windows and it is easy to get lost in your work and to also be part of this mindset where it's like, it's, it's art, it's music. We have to give it everything. We have to work 16 hours and never sleep and not eat and like sacrifice everything for the music. It doesn't work. It's not productive to do that. So my advice, well, this is what I said last time, so I'll just say it again. Get a dog, because when you have a dog, oh, yeah. <laughs> you have to go outside. You have to walk your little buddy. You have to take care of them. And having a dog gives you some a, a good, healthy perspective. When you're really, like, really in the weeds with a project, it's nice to be able to look over at a little furry thing wagging his tail and be like, yep, yeah, we're cool here. <laughs> That's great. No, I am very much a fan of the outdoors and recently this year we have brought in a lot more camping into my life and it just makes me so happy. Yes. Like there's nothing like being somewhere without any reception and just really, yeah, getting back to the roots of, of everything. Yes, so, you can unplug and be in the present. Yes, 
Yeah. Oh, such a great way to recharge. So that's a good one. Get outside. Cool. All right. And the last one, what is your one general life tip? That's harder. My mind's like spinning like a Rolodex of, uh, you know, you know what I tell my kids? <laughs> Lots though? of things. This is what I tell my kids. Put something good into the world every day. That's all you have to do. Just as you're moving through life, kind of make sure that you're putting more goodness into it than you're taking out of it. So leave the world with an abundance of goodness. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's such a great way to end the episode. Thank you so much, Jessica. That's been really insightful and I've learned a lot from it. Thank you so, so much. So I appreciate it. I am so grateful that you <laughs> invited me to be on your podcast. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye. My biggest three takeaways from Jessica's episode was firstly to listen out for the artist's intentions in their recordings before you go in to restore them. So try and work out what it is that they're trying to convey before taking out noise and anything else. My second biggest takeaway was that a lot of the work in restoration happens before the recording process when you are digitizing physical audio. So to spend a bit of time on that to make sure you get a good recording at the end. And my last takeaway was to stay humble and to keep working on your craft. Things don't happen overnight, so keep your head down and keep getting better at what you do. That's it from us this week. I hope you enjoyed the episode and look forward to seeing you in two weeks.